All right, we are live talking with Rashad Beard from Panther Nation Podcast on the Our Lads Football Network on the Our Lads Football YouTube channel. Rashad, of course, covers the Carolina Panthers, if you didn't know. How's it going, Rashad? Yeah, pretty obvious, right? I think I think I got it all covered <laughs> uh, with the Panthers. Yep, it's my squad. Yeah. And Rashad has had a good habit of being the first guest to kick off. Because uh, remember, you were you were my first guest to kick off the uh, the off season preview, and now you're the first guest to recap the NFL draft. So even though you didn't a have a pick, thing. I, don't, I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing, but we'll we'll roll with it. Well, the first <laughs> one is not a good thing. This one is just a coincidence. So, yeah, yeah you, you want to stay away from me interviewing you early in the off season. That's for sure. <laughs> Uh, noted, uh, noted. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we're gonna go over the uh draft picks. Uh, Carolina had seven, uh, actually ended up with a pick in each round. Uh, and uh, Dan Morgan uh, had his first draft. So, I tell you what, uh, and, oh, by the way, of course, got to remind everybody here who is watching live or on demand, uh, subscribing to this channel, especially if you're a Carolina Panther fan. Uh, because Rashad is always going to be here to talk Carolina Panthers football with us. So you didn't never want to miss that. Um, and uh, we're also going to give away a PDF uh, for the draft review guide on the show. Um, I believe we're going to do that, even though I haven't figured out exactly how we're going to get the contact information, but we'll figure it out as we go. Okay. So uh, let's start first of all with Dan Morgan, Rashad. What did you think about his first draft? Uh, overall, I thought it was okay. Uh, I think we got to di dive into each pick to really kind of uh, attack the nuance of why I, I feel a certain type of way. But uh, overall, um, you know, with the new coaching staff, new direction, I'm not mad at the at the draft. I think it's a very, uh, I think it's a developmental draft. Uh, this, that's something you've you've heard me say if you've been listening to uh, anything related to the Carolina Panthers, any kind of draft talk. It's not one of those drafts, drafts where you're going to see immediate impact from any of the players, in my opinion. Uh, but it's going to be a two to three year thing. And so, you know, the thing is that the thing is this, you know, we've got to give those guys time. Uh, the coaching staff, Dan Morgan, they've got to have time to develop the guys they select. You've heard me say it over and over and over again. The biggest problem with the Carolina Panthers is that we we change direction every every year. Every time every time there's a new coach, there's a new philosophy new coaches i didn't draft this guy i don't he doesn't fit what i want to do and so guys get lost in the sauce there's so many guys i can name on this roster now that still are still on the roster that have been drafted by prior regimes and they just never develop and then hopefully um you know we've learned our lesson ownership down right have learned their lesson and let these guys develop yeah because that was actually my first major note as well um that the top three picks uh, or, uh, have all limited experience. It uh, doesn't mean that they haven't performed well with that limited experience, but it, it's 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 like you said, when, when you come into the NFL and you're basically only a one-year starter type guy, and it looks like, again, um, the top three picks uh, fit that uh, mold, that uh, it is going to be what you said, a, a developmental type deal. And that's left up to the coaching staff. That's also something that we've talked about a lot and something that you have, has really bothered you regarding uh, this franchise is the lack of coaching and developing players. Yeah, I mean, nail on the head. The, that's the biggest problem with the Carolina Panthers is that we lack direction. from, And it starts at the top, right? I, I've been very critical of ownership. I will say this year it appears that things have gotten better. Now, I, I'm, I, I always call it like I see it. I have not been the happiest with the ownership. Uh, and, again, it, it, he's going to run it the way he wants to. My opinion doesn't matter. But, obviously, the proof is in the pudding, right? Two two wins last year it's not has not been very good, and it all starts at the top. I think he's starting to learn his lesson a little bit here just based off the movements and based off the way things are going. You can tell some things are starting to shift with uh with the way things are, are working so hopefully you know all we can do at the end of the day you know i've sat down i sat down with steve smith uh, a couple weeks ago steve smith senior on cut to it and uh listen one of the things he talks about all the time is listen at the end of the day you guys are fans he respect he says this respectfully right we're, we're fans and we can't change the outcomes at the end of the day whether we like it or not the moves are being made and we have to live with them and either you're going to pack your bags and become fans, fans of another franchise or you're going to keep cheering. So all we can do at this point is hope that Dave Tepper learns his lessons 
and allows his coaching staff to uh, uh, to do their thing. That's really yep. that's really all we can do. Yep, uh, that is exactly the way that I felt when the Jets uh, hired Joe Douglas. I said, "Hey, you know what? I like what I see so far." And ever since then, I've been on board. And just like you said, you have to either trust the man and trust what they're doing, or you don't. And if you don't, okay. But hey, you know what? You got to root for your team as best as possible, uh, and that's all you can do. Not that you have to take it up to you know what. Uh, if, right. <laughs> uh, if the coaching sucks uh, or yeah. the, uh, the the moves uh, regarding your general manager and your owner uh, uh, are, are pretty similar. So it's just a matter, though. Of, and I think, like you said, that's why it's important to voice your opinion as a fan, because then that's what gets you would imagine the owner, especially to to understand something's not right. And so oh, yeah. Dan Morgan gets his opportunity uh, for the draft for the very first time. And Carolina Panthers fans uh, like yourself. Uh, we're probably sitting there late in the draft uh, thinking, well, you know, I mean, we don't have a pick. So uh, I guess, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> this is just entertaining. You know, this is what happens sometimes. And then, boom, all of a sudden, uh, Carolina Panthers make a move, come into the first round. And before they made the move, what did you think based on your research and everything that you were hearing? What did you believe the move was for? Well, I obviously knew it was for a wide receiver. Which one? I had no idea. Um, but this is something. This is why we live stream. We live stream the first day, even though we didn't have a pick. We were on watching and reacting live because we knew it was a possibility. Moving from thirty second into the back into the late, uh, the late uh, first round is plausible, right? That's something that you're not going to give up a lot of a lot of draft capital to do. So we knew had there been a run on wide receivers, which there was started, it started to happen, right? You saw. Uh, Saw a couple guys go. Um, Xavier Worthy went, and that was a top target for me. I thought Xavier Worthy adds something to this offense that we haven't seen in a long time, that speed, the ability to stretch the field. So I thought, let's try to go get Worthy. The Bills, I don't know why uh, they they did what they did. Arch enemy, you know, the, you can't <laughs> seem to get over the Chiefs hump, but you trade to the Chiefs and I'll give them one of the best weapons in the draft. That makes zero sense to me. That will probably come back to haunt them. Uh, over the next couple of years, but uh, they they swap picks right in front of us, and so when when um you know when when that happened, I figured, hey, we're probably gonna get ready to take a wide receiver here, and just didn't know which one. Um, now when it happened, and I don't know if you want to get want me to get into the pick, but sure. Z- Z- yeah, Xavier Leggett, I believe we we all knew this was gonna happen, right? I kind of thought maybe it would be Lad McConkey or another wide receiver. Uh, maybe a, I think a Pearsall had already went. There were some other guys that I was like, all right, I can see us taking one of these guys. But Xavier Leggett seemed like, if you're reading the tea leaves, he seemed like he was going to be the guy from the jump. He's a South Carolina guy. Uh, he's local. Um, and we he basically went out. He came out and told us that, hey, if he's sitting there at 33, the Panthers said they're going to take me. He said that during the, the draft process. Okay. right. So everything you needed to know had already been said. Like they okay. pretty much – said that this was going to be the pick. I mean, obviously, you don't want it out there. Canellas tried to walk it back. <laughs> yeah. He tried to say, hey, we told a lot of guys that. But yeah. truthfully, we I'm sure he was one of the only guys we told that. Uh, but you got to play chess, so I understand it. But Xavier Leggett is uh, is interesting. Very interesting pick. Um, again, like you mentioned, very, not, mer- not, not very much production. Uh, there's really reasons to that, right? He's had some issues. He lost his parents, some injury issues with COVID year. There's some things that a tribute to why lackluster quarterback play True. Um, terrible, terrible offensive coordination, right? There's a lot of things, right? Once he got Spencer Rattler, once he got a, a NFL caliber um, play caller, right? Things got better for him. And that's when he, he completely flipped the script. So yes, you could say red flag one year production. Easy to say that, right? But you got to dig a little bit deeper. Yep. Um, the guy has sure hands. Um, I, I believe what his ability to, uh, those the the routes across the middle of the field, the digs, the slants, that's where he wins, right? He's a big body receiver. He can kind of shade off of the uh, you know, close off the 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 cornerbacks and get those guys out the way. And I believe that's where he's gonna win. Now he's speedy too, right? He can stretch the field. Is his route running there completely? Not quite. He's gonna develop, and even he'll tell you that. He's been saying, I'm gonna I, my releases are gonna get better. I'm going to be, uh, you know, develop a full route tree. He's got to get better. The great news, though, this is what I say about, you know, about the way we constructed our roster. He doesn't have to be wide receiver one day one. 
Yep. Right. That's that. That's the beautiful thing about this. You've got Deontay Johnson. We picked up from the Steelers. Love that pick. You still got Adam Thielen. Right. You still got Jonathan Mingo. I believe we're going to bring him in, bring him along. He's going to be uh, productive. Right. But I'm not calling for a thousand yard season this rookie year. That's not what I, the expectation for, for me. You know what I mean? So and I think another uh, underrated aspect of his game is the special teams uh, aspect. He contributes on special teams. We've even even had him running special teams drills already at mini camp. So I, I think one stat that I have is that he had he averaged twenty six point six yards per return on twenty five returns over the past two years, taking one to the house. You know what I mean? So he's a very he can play special teams, especially with the new kickoff rules. Right, that's a part yes. to this. That plays a part into this. And so again, I, I think that may be the reason as to why we drafted Xavier Leggett uh, with our uh, first round. Well. Trade it up to get him in the first round. Do you do you think that the team views him as a high number two and not necessarily a number one? Personally, I would. This is that that's exactly how I view him. I view him as a high end number two. I'm not going to put him as a if he develops into num, a number sure. one, great. But year one, year two, let's get you. Let's move you around. We're going to put you at the you know we're going to put you at the Y. We'll move you around. Right. We'll move you around. The, around the field, put you in the slot. We'll put you outside. We'll see where you fit, and we'll yep. develop you into maybe an X at the end of the day. We'll we'll see what happens. Um, but I don't I don't know. I don't anticipate that happening. And this is why you have Deontay Johnson. This is why you have Adam Thielen there. So you don't you kind of protecting yourself just in case. But yeah, I think he's a weapon that you're going to move around. There's no set role for him. It's whatever he develops into, wherever wherever we can get the best out of him. And I see. I think that's what you're going to see out of out of him year one. Yeah, and taking a look at the rest of the receiver depth chart uh, right now, because you mentioned Deontay mm-hmm. Johnson was a big offseason acquisition. Uh, Thielen is still a very steady presence uh, in the slot. Um, but you've got Terrence Marshall still trying to develop. Jonathan Mingo is going into year two and next year. Is a, both of them are second-round draft picks, even though mm-hmm. um, obviously Dan Morgan did not draft them. Uh, Smith Marset could also be a very interesting player that we talked about, uh, given maybe an opportunity now. To, to finally, uh, uh, you know, take advantage of his abilities. So what do you think about the room? Because it definitely looks like it's a lot more exciting on paper than it has been the last few years. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing that Canellis has talked about and has executed is bringing in talent and competition, right? It's it's not a high-end room, but I think they're going to they're gonna push each other. I think Deontay Johnson is very, very underrated. I think we truly could have an a, a, a wide receiver one um, I think he's dealt with some issues up there in Pittsburgh, you know, wasn't quite getting the football, but man, he is putting in so much work right now. If you follow him on Twitter or on X, he is posting all kind of workout videos. He looks great. I cannot wait to see what he does in this offense. Um, so I'm excited about Deontay. I'm really excited about him. Uh, but like you said, Terrace Marshall is a guy, he, he is the exact guy that I described earlier in the introduction of this, this pod, right? A guy that got drafted. He's dealt with several coaching changes. He had his best production under Steve Wilkes, who was an interim head coach, right? He had his we we thought we had a guy. We thought we had him. We we saw the peak of Terrace Marshall at that point. Since then, Frank Wright fell right back under the radar. So we don't know what we had. And he yeah. he requested a trade last year. Obviously, that that did not uh, matriculate to anything. So we will see with him, but I can see him actually not making this uh, 53-man roster. And a guy you did not bring up is undrafted free agent Jalen Coker is a guy you need to keep an eye on out of Holy Cross. Very highly touted wide receiver. Steve Smith had him ranked in the top 20 in 2024 draft. Calls him okay. the best route runner in this class. Keep an eye wow. on him. We had him on our show. Very good kid. Um, and so keep an eye. I'm, I'm not saying he's going to make the roster. I, I, please don't take my words for, for that. I'm just saying that make the practice he, squad? He... he he we paid him we we paid him as a, a undrafted free agent so i'm there he's a high priority a couple hundred thousand we played him a couple hundred thousand so yeah. i think the expectation is for him to to push and make the 53 man roster but he has to work for it, it is an uphill course, battle like yes. you just like you just mentioned there's a lot of good names in that room right he's got to overcome you know your smith marsets uh your, your, your john domingo so it's going to be tough it's going to be tough for him but if he does i think he's a guy that can develop into maybe a number two down the road. Maybe you have your one and two in Leggett and Coker down the road. I'm just talking out loud, uh, sure, but, you okay. know, it could that's happen. That's best case scenario. Best yeah. case scenario, if that happens, the Panthers, Panthers are in good shape. 
Well, again, what I really like about it, and like you said, there may not be a true like number one like star guy on the roster, but there's a lot of other. Again, it's a much deeper, exciting group of uh, prospects uh, that look like that th- they could all contribute at some point in their careers. Hopefully, of course, here um, I'm, I'm taking a look at the uh, R Lads draft guide. You could still mm-hmm, purchase mm-hmm. this. This is actually the best time to purchase it because don't think that the draft is over what what use is this well the reason this is useful is because matter of fact every pick including coker has a uh a profile here in the guide so i was taking a look at it and coker yeah yeah what does it, actually, what does it say about coker read it off read it yeah, off to me <laughs> yeah he was projected as a as a fifth to seventh round draft pick exactly. so as high as fifth uh so they got him as a college free agent as you said uh, three-year starter, all Patriot League for three seasons. So if you if you're getting a guy from the FCS, you better be the best from uh, from that uh, from that league that you're in. And he obviously was. He was a first-team All-American uh, in uh, 2023. Set a program record and leading the nation in touchdowns with 15. Uh, and uh, finishing as a Walter Payton Award finalist. Uh, they say he's a consistent big play threat against lower level college football. So obviously uh, it's all about uh, what he does when he plays with the big boys. Now mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. overall, I can throw in some uh, other t- little notes here. Uh, the consistency and reliability in his game with the occasional flashes of, of dominance are encouraging signs when projecting such a large leap into the NFL uh, rare explosion for a player at his size. He's at six, one, two Oh eight. Runs a four five seven, advanced route runner, like you said, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. quarterback friendly target with huge hands. Does a lot of the little things right. And then the only, I guess, uh, the negative because uh, there's always going to be negatives. Does not play sure. big with the ball in his hands. Struggles to create after the catch. But yeah. uh, to get a kid, I would like agree. That, yes, I, I would agree with all that. I would agree with all that assessment. Uh, I think that. He's definitely uh, a reliable, uh, reliable receiver. Good hands, doesn't drop many footballs. Can get open with his route running, which is something we have missed around these parts. Uh, and so now you got a couple good, you got like three good route runners. You got Deontay Johnson, very good route runner. You got Adam Thielen, very good route runner, and potentially Coker, another good route runner. And so, and like you said, I think the biggest thing is that you know he's got he's got to show up against uh, the NFL caliber talent even even Dave Canales has said that right we got to see what he can do against NFL caliber talent they have joined together uh with the rookies have joined the veterans this week and so we're, we're going to start to see training camp's going to be very good for him but i just want to say this it's not this this is not uh unlikely for him to make the roster we've seen undrafted guys make 53 men roster all the time and show out so it's not right. it's not unprobable at all it, the, the best the greatest wide receiver in the in the history of nfl jerry rice came from a fcs school uh you know hbcu so come on let's it, it's it's uh, it's it's probable it's probable for sure okay so uh that is wide receiver uh and again Leggett as well as coker uh, definitely worthy of uh, our, our discussion here. Next up, they go back to offense uh, with our lads top rated running back uh, for this class, Jonathan Brooks, who like Leggett, just a, like a one year starter production wise. Uh, but, you know, uh, Leggett, different path. Brooks, he just had some really good players in front of him. So, yeah, a little bit different path. Um, but uh, bottom line is uh, the major news on Brooks is the recovery. From the ACL injury, um, even though nowadays, uh, matter of fact, we've seen that with Brees Hall last year. He made a really good recovery. Most of the time, it's it's usually going to be as long as everything works out well with the doctor and rehab, he should be fine. Um, but the other thing that sticks out with Brooks is he's going to add an instant impact in the receiving game um, more than anything and eventually could turn into, of course, the number one running back uh, on this team. Ding, 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 ding. You hit the nail right on the head. Uh, the receiving ability out the backfield is why he is a Carolina Panther. We have not seen that since Christian McCaffrey. Uh, and I, I, let me say this. I think Chuba has gotten better, right? Chuba has improved his hands because he was terrible. He was terrible, he, but he's developed. He's developed into a really, really good running back uh, and a complete running back, right? And But I think Jonathan Brooks, very, very, very good. And I, I'm surprised. You got to add some context to how we got him, right? Because we traded back. We traded all the way back until like the late second round and then traded back up, right? 
So we traded back up into the second. Okay. But not only did we trade, we when we traded back, we acquired a 2025 future second round pick from the Rams when they when they took Braden Fisk. So there's a lot that goes into just to acquiring Jonathan Brooks. It's not just about okay. you know, Jonathan Brooks himself. There's there's the chess move that was made by Dan Morgan to to complete, right? Remember all that stuff we gave up to get Bryce Young? How about how about we got a first round pick back? How about now we got our future second round pick back? How about we had two second round picks, right? So the chess that was yes. played, right, to get those to make yourself whole again. Shout out to Dan Morgan, kudos to him. But and to not only that, it end up like you said, the top running back in the draft, uh, Jonathan yep. Brooks, very good, slippery guy. His ability to make the first man miss is incredible. A lot of upside. He's only had one football, uh, one fumble. Excuse me. He's only twenty years old. Not the he's not going to be the nuanced route runner, right? You're not going to be able to slide him out, put him in a slot, anything like that. But he's going to be very good. You taking those swing passes out the backfield, making that first man miss, and he's out of here. Like he's got that's the type of guy you're going to get, Jonathan Brooks. A lot of forced missed tackles. Um, you know, it's, it, it's very good. Like you said, he's it, this is going to be another situation like we talked about with um, Xavier Leggett, right? Uh, yep. Where the the running back room is crowded, right? You've got Chuba Hubbard. You got uh, Miles Sanders. We just signed Rashad Penny, right? The, the, it's crowded. It is a crowded running back room. And so may the best man win. I do think it's going to be a, a running back by committee. So when you talk about fantasy, things like that, Jonathan Brooks, and I'll, I'm not all familiar with how Dynasty and stuff works, but if you need somebody for the future. Oh, yeah. This is the kid. Yes. This is the get, getting Jonathan Brooks later. Bro, not this year. This year won't be the time. Because he's gonna, it's gonna, the carries will be split amongst those three, four guys, depending, maybe four. But yeah, next year true. when Ch- when Chuba Hubbard's potentially he's on a contract year this year, Miles Sanders I'm sure is walking out that door with the way that contract is set up. There's no way he stays after this year. So ne- the next year he could be RB one, and if you go back and look what Canales did with Rashad White, uh, in Tampa Bay, this kid has a lot, a ton of upside if he can stay healthy. So I'm all on the Jonathan Brooks train. I did not. I'm not going to be honest with you. I got to be honest, Greg. I, I, I'm consistent. You know, we've come up here and we talked a lot about running backs and Christian McCaffrey. I, if you go back and look at some of those episodes, and I'm not the biggest fan of paying running backs. I'm not the biggest fan of uh, spending high draft capital on a running back. However, with what I mentioned earlier with getting back those picks and maneuvering in the draft and doing what they did, I'm not mad at this pick at all. And – um, I think this is a future play next year and year three. That's when this pick is going to pay off. Well, you mentioned white and that's a good reference because that's what really uh, sticks out about white uh, at Tampa Bay. And now did he have a lot of carries? Yes. But the thing that really makes white the player he is with Tampa Bay and how successful he was uh, with Canales there was his ability to uh, catch out of the backfield and make big plays in space. Um, and so that's exactly, I'm, I'm assuming that's what he uh, saw in Brooks. And so uh, getting the first running back rated uh, in the draft in the second round makes a lot of sense because, again, this is about where everybody thought uh, the top running back was going to go somewhere early in the second round. And then you wind up, like you said, getting an extra pick out of it anyway, which is awesome. So, um, by the way, Blackshear, taking a look at the depth chart, Blackshear, he's he's you think he's only on the team because he's going to be like maybe the number one kick returner. Yeah. So he had he offers uh, extreme. return ability right so he's a very okay. good returner uh it, it's gonna be tough that running back room is crowded man uh yeah. so i'm sure somebody's gonna get you know between uh rashad penny uh between you know um uh, miles sanders but maybe black shear it just depends because we have so many guys that offer special teams ability when you talk about xavier Leggett, you talk about smith marset black shear all those guys can return so I, I think that it's gonna be very interesting when it when it comes to the rest of those guys and really quick, going back to Jonathan Brooks, this is an interesting stat here. He's the only running back in the 2024 draft that was top five in career yards per touch, 6.8 yards per touch, and missed force tackles per touch. So he's very, very good. Um, he's going to make that first man miss. Um, and one thing, one another interesting note, of his 1,139 yard uh, rushing yards, 732 were deemed after first contact. So that's that's how I mean that's what we're talking about here. This guy can make a make a man miss 
and uh, I'm excited to see him again. We'll see him in. We'll see him get in, in the rotation when he's healthy, when he's ready to go. But I think year two, year three is when is uh, really going to pay. Him. All right. So uh, I was uh, putting up the depth chart uh, as you spoke. So now we can take a look at it while we're talking. And I tell you what, what I want to do is, is I want to skip over uh, to the fourth round pick since it's offense and we'll, we'll stick with the offensive approach. Uh, so in this one, so the fourth round. Oh, and, and the other thing I wanted to say is that you were talking about dynasty and we will have a little bit of a dynasty segment uh, before we wrap up. But I just wanted to note, I was taking a look at the dynasty league that I'm in with, uh, with your partner, Dave, and uh, uh, Brooks was the ninth pick in the first round. So um, he actually, he was the first running back picked in our league. And uh, he went ahead of, let's see, players like uh, Bo Nix, Brock Bowers, uh, Brian Thomas, uh, and so forth. So uh, that's just to let you know uh, a little bit about uh, Dynasty, which again, I want to talk uh, more later. Okay, uh, tight end. Now, to be able to get one of the, the top tight end prospects, because Brock Bowers is on a, an island of his own. So, mm -hmm. okay, he's just, he's like a freak. But I think a lot of people thought Sanders was the second best tight end for most of the process. Now, it didn't end out that way with our lads. They didn't rate him as the second best. But still, I think overall, um, uh, there's a lot of people who believe uh, this kid has got uh, – great potential based on his athletic traits. Now there was some mystery because, uh, or confusion, maybe you could say, because it was a little bit of a surprise that he didn't test as well at the combine. A lot of people thought he's just a great athlete. Look at what we're going to see at the combine. It never happened. So I'm interested to, to find out whether or not uh, there was any talk there about that. Um, uh, because he's not a very big guy. He's one of those He's not one of those traditional big tight end types, which the NFL is going away from anyway, but, what I'm, I would assume that they really like about him is that he's got the ability to be used in a variety of roles and make uh, life very difficult on the opposition when he's out there uh, because he can play uh, in a lot of different spots, backfield, wide out, slot. That's going to make Dave Canales happy as well. Yep, bingo. This and I, I may surprise you here, but this is my favorite pick of our draft. This okay. is my favorite pick. This the value that we got here um, is it, it's very very good. Yeah, he's very he's a, a very consistent uh, vertical threat. He's going to be a mismatch for a linebacker. He's going to be a mismatch for a smaller cornerback that you try to put in the nickel. He's got very very good reliable hands. He didn't drop a single pass in 2023. He's only had four drops his entire career. So he's he's very good and like you said you can move him in the slide, you can play him in line. Now, he's not the best blocker in the world. I'm sure that's no. in your draft guy. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure that's in the draft guy. Not yeah. going to be your best blocker. You're not going to put him out there uh, in, in goal line scenario and tell him to move a pile. That's not happening. But if you need to stretch the field, get those seam routes going. A again, I think that's what Canellis wants to do, those quick passes, those quick seam routes. Get him the, the football in space. He's going to make some guys miss. I think that that's where you're going to win with him. And who cares about the underwear Olympics? I'm going to be honest with you. I don't care what he tested. When oh, you turn yeah. on that film, I agree. When you turn on when you turn on the film, this guy is very, very size, a true athlete. And I, I guarantee you he plays faster than he runs for sure. Um, and again, I think like you said, a lot of the analysts had him run uh wanted had him running faster in the force uh six nine, but I'll take that. I'll take that. He plays way faster than that. Um he brought up Brock Bowers. Interesting stat here, interesting stat alert. Uh he had 99 catches over the past two seasons that only trailed Brock Bowers. Right. That's it. Sure. Yeah, he had uh, yeah, he had 12 20 yard receptions in 2023. That's just one fewer than Brock Bowers, who led the F uh, FBS. So yep. this guy, this kid is good, man. He's good. And he was in a very good offense. And I'll say this, too. Had he not been in that offense with uh, Xavier Worthy and Adonai Mitchell, he would have had a thousand yard uh, been a thousand yard receiver. That's how good this kid is. He is very solid. Uh, yep. Again, he's got to develop. He's got to be. Uh, he's got to get that blocking ability up because we don't want to be predictable. We don't want to sure. say, okay, when J when uh, Jatavion Sanders is in the game, that means we're going to throw. We don't want to be predictable, right? So he's got to be become a better blocker, and that falls on Canellis putting him in the best position to succeed, getting him in the best position to block, right? Get him some help. Make sure he's combo blocking with somebody, um, and not just out there on the island with with a uh, you know with with the uh, uh, you know somebody elite, right? So just 
we got to we got to protect him, right? Make sure he's not out there getting abused. But I, I like this player. I, he's my favorite player in this draft the, the, because of the value. Because I think, like you said, um, I think he is. Uh, I think he was probably you know ranked a, a, between the second and third round pick, uh, and we got him in, at the top of the fourth. So I'm very happy about that value. By the way, um, last year, uh, going over what Canales ran in Tampa, um, mm-hmm. the stats say that he ran. Um, oh, he ranked where the Bucks ranked seventh in the NFL and using uh, 12 personnel. So uh, getting that second tight end means you're going to see a lot of Tremble and Sanders out there. Uh, and, um, and now this kind of eases the, 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 the whole deal with Tremble because I'm sure he hasn't lived up to his third round grade. I mean, his third round status, but the fact is that, um, Right now, that's what Sanders is here for. He, he's here for to be the number one guy. And before we move over to the defense, that's the thing that impresses me about this draft is that you just look at it. You look at this depth chart. You see Leggett. You see Sanders. You see Brooks. And by next year, you've got, as, as long as everything works out, everybody's uh, um, developing well, you've got three, you got receiver, tight end, running back, impact players in one draft. So, yep. And, and a young quarterback, so they can all. And a young together. quarterback, it's, yes. it's great. I mean, that's that's how you want to build a team, and uh, I hope I hope it works out. But we'll, we'll only time will tell. Only time will all tell. Right. All right, now on defense. So let's start with that third round pick. And matter of fact, the team uh, went with two linebackers, third and seventh, Trevin Wallace in round three, and Michael Barrett from Michigan in round seven. A uh, couple, of, not, not necessarily the same player. Uh, one of the things I noticed, um, and, b- and by the way, Trevin Wallace um, might have been a little bit of a surprise that he was drafted in the third round. Um, so there's that. So I'd like to know what it is that they liked about him so much that they uh, picked him in the third round. But w- w- what I thought was interesting about Barrett is that besides, of course, playing you know three years as a starter for a national championship team last year as well, um, very good as a zone defender, zone cover linebacker. And I know this is something that we talked about that this, that the team needed one of the needs going into the off season for Carolina was finding a good cover linebacker, somebody that can cover running backs out of the backfield. Um, and also somebody that could improve the zone coverage of the unit, which was not very good last year. So I'm not trying to put all that on Michael Barrett. I'm just trying to say that that's probably why he uh, fits. And also Barrett brings uh, potentially elite. You talked about special teams. He also brings potentially elite special teams play uh, to that unit. So talk about those two players, uh, including uh, Wallace and uh, why they drafted him in the third round. Yeah. So Michael, well, go, going back to bear, I think bear is probably going to be, end up being, like you said, a special teams contributor. I don't see him, you know, fitting in and doing anything too crazy uh, when it comes to playing like inside or outside. I don't, I don't see him fitting in there just yet. Maybe he develops into that. But I got as a seventh round pick. I mean, probably going to be special teams. Uh, but Trevin Wallace again. I, I thought this was a, a reach. I'm gonna be honest. When when they announced the pick, there were other guys that I would have taken there. Guys like T.J. Tampa, cornerbacks. I, I, we have a still and to right even right now, even though we drafted one, we still have a major need at cornerback. So I was a, a little disappointed in that. But the reason why they like this kid, and I think he's starting to grow on a lot of people, is he has that dog mentality. He's a really really good athlete. Uh, I, when he was doing his introductory press conference, he said they, they they asked him to describe what dog meant to him. And he says, quote, you go in there and hurt somebody and you'd be like, hey, I did this and I'm going to do it again. Right. This this is the kind of guy. This is the kind of guy <laughs> that Trevin Wallace is. He is a dog. Uh, he he plays with fierceness. And he's going to do a, a, a lot of what Frankie Louvu um, was doing here. And I, I, you, you know, I'm a huge Frankie Louvu guy. Oh, yeah. Uh, I liked him a lot. Uh, I was hoping that we paid him, but obviously the, in the priority of paying guys, it just did not fit with what we wanted to do. So we ended up drafting a guy. And I think we kind of got a guy that fits that same mold, super athletic, right? This guy is at sideline to sideline. He can do a great job. Uh, he can cover ground. He can, you can line up against a tight end and he can hang right there. Uh, you can line him up against a slot. He'll try his try his best to hang in there, uh, but he's raw, right? He's raw at the end of the day. Uh, he still has to learn, you know, the linebacker position as a whole. And right now he's more reactive, right, than he is instinctive. So we yep. got to get him to a, a situation where he's got to be able to read. And I think we got one of the greatest linebackers of all time that he has access to in Luke Keekley. And Luke Keekley spoke highly of him. And if he can get in the film room with Luke, 
and start <laughs> to develop some of those keys, right? Yeah. He he would be so good because that's how athletic he is. That he, he he leaned on his athleticism a lot when he was at Kentucky because hey, I can chase down these guys. I'm so quick, I'm so fast that I can I can chase down a guy. In the NFL, you won't be able to do that. You got to sure. be able to react. And and so hopefully he'll he'll get better with that. Um, but he can pursue very well. He can pursue oh, yeah. very very well. And we'll we'll see what happens, man. Um, I, again, I think he'll be in rotation. What do you guys have him? Uh, you guys have him what? Uh, inside right behind Shaq. Rotation up behind Shaq. I get yeah, yeah. I see that. I see that for sure. Um, definitely not going to be a starter day one. You know, you got Josie Jewel sitting there too, so he'll he'll rotate in. I think there's definitely going to be a role for him. You'll see him on the field, uh, and as a third rounder, uh, that's what we expect. But yep. um, I wouldn't expect the huge impact player. You know, uh, day one. Yeah, I mean, it, it, when you draft a guy in the third round at that spot, and just taking a look at the depth chart, what it sh- says to me is is he will hopefully be the guy that will be replacing Shaq. At some point, in the next couple of years, Shaq will go lose a step. Whenever that is, Trevin Wallace uh, will then come in and be the man. So uh, again, it's all about development. So and, and also uh, showing you mentioned, and I know I said it with Barrett, but you know he also shows very uh, good range and coverage too. So uh, that is also going to be a big help um, for uh, something they lacked last year and special teams. Okay. So uh, let's now move on to, oh, you know what? Before we do that, I want to remind everybody, this was last year's draft guide. This was actually the draft review guide from last year. Okay. So this is coming out soon and uh, we are going to have that available. We'll have a link in the description. You can check it out. Go to rlads.com and purchase, get a head start on purchasing your draft review guide uh, from rlads. Okay. So let's uh, stick with the defense in our final two picks. Fifth round, they went corner uh, with Smith Wade from Washington State. And uh, I guess the big knock on, on Smith Wade is his size. You know, he's a slender mm-hmm. kid. That's why uh, that, that's the big knock. But uh, taking a look at him on film, taking a look at his scouting report, uh, he has uh, a lot of good cover man skills. And that's obviously important. Uh, for that position. And he, he also is somebody that is going to give it his all. I mean, he's an energy yep. guy. And so you like that combination. So yes, if he was bigger, he might've been a second round pick or a third round pick, but he goes into the fifth round because of his size. Now it's up once again to the coaching staff to make sure that he can have a fit on this team. Where do you think he fits? Because I know he played more outside in college, but a lot of people believe that it's going to be better off, which is why I'm sure he's listed as the backup nickel right now on the depth chart. Yeah, I think that's going to be the fit for him uh, in, in the short term anyway. Uh, I think, like you mentioned with his size, I think he's, what, 5'9", 184. Uh, I don't see him lining up against Mike Evans too often. Uh, that That's not not ideal. No. Um, <laughs> but uh, also I'll say this, though. I mean, he kind of mirrors in everything that you just just, just described – he definitely mirrors a Dante Jackson who we just had on this roster now playing for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He has that little bit of dog, you know, he plays with that energy. He's got a, a you know, a loud bark, you know what I mean? He might be in a small package, but he, he has a large, a loud bark. Um, and I'll give him credit for this too. I said this on my, on my previous show with Steve Smith that we talk about the size, we talk about the knocks, uh, but the kid, he played in the pack 12 against some of those really uh, pack two or two pack, whatever it is, whatever you want to call it now. They don't have too, too many teams left. Uh, but he he played in that in that tough conference where you know you lined up against you know some very very tough talent McMillan, yep. uh, you know uh, Troy Franklin those guys over in there they were really good wide receivers uh, over in Washington that he had to cover he, he I think he was the second highest rated uh, cornerback in the Pac-12 so he he played outside he has experience outside I think he can develop into an outside cornerback but in the short term I definitely he think he um, he plays nickel. And he did a great job in learning the nickel position at the senior bowl, right? He had never played nickel before until he got to the senior bowl and did a, a great job. According to all the scouts that were there, he did a, a wonderful job playing the nickel. And so I think he's going to stick at the nickel. I think he's going to play whatever the coaches ask him to do. He's that type of kid. Uh, he's got a, a lot of dog in him and uh, we'll see. I, I have no, idea, I have no idea what to expect from him. Sure. Uh, but I'm, ex- I'm excited. Back up nickel. I can see it. Troy Hill, you know, again, like we said so many times now, you develop him. Troy Hill won't probably, is getting older, probably won't be here next year. You put in Shaw Smith Wade there, and we'll see what happens. 
again, development, 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 development. Yep. And then uh, the final pick on defense, uh, as far as our uh, show is concerned, at least, uh, was the sixth round defensive tackle, Jaden Crumity from Mississippi State. And this is a big dude, 6'3", about 300 pounds. But what sticks out is his five years of starting experience. He's played in 53 games. He's played all along the defensive line. He's even st- he's even stood up as a linebacker, which I'd like to see for a 300-pound guy if he was 300 pounds at the time. But he's got huge arms uh, and uh, also uh, you know good height and all that. So uh, why do you think they made this pick? How does he fit in with the defense? Yeah, I think definitely going to be an interior guy on that three man front, uh, and I think he can. Man, yeah, I think the the biggest reason why why they got him was his ability to stop the run. He's 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 going to be able uh, to to eat up some space, clog those rushing lanes, allow our linebackers to move freely. I think that's the biggest reason why you got Jaden. Uh, he's again. <laughs> I think Dave made a joke when we were on the show with Steve Smith. I think he played under like four or five head coaches. Uh, when he was at Mississippi State, and we, so so Dave said he'll fit right in here in Carolina. Uh, but but <laughs> that's True. not funny. You're not supposed to laugh at that. You're not supposed to laugh. Only I, I can, can laugh, laugh at, at that. Panthers. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's funny. I'm joking. But yeah, so I think that um, again, I I think a lot of experience. He's gonna it's gonna take some time because he is an older player, right? He's been able to move some guys a little bit younger than him in college. Now he's got it. He's in the NFL with the big boys. So he's got to develop his body, get stronger, um, and, you know, to play in the trenches. We've seen guys like Derek Brown go through the same transition, you know, getting used to the physicality in the trenches. It's going to take us some time. Yep. He's older, so he's got to accelerate. Uh, but I think he's going to be a, a rotational, like you guys have him, rotational uh, interior defensive lineman or in 3-4 defense. Um, and, I, again, I like it. I, I like this. I like the kid. I think he's going to see some time. Six-round pick. So, again, not expecting too much, but I like it. Yeah, and it's also very important that that because uh, one of the things that has uh, hurt the uh, the program, as you know, has uh, been these, well, a lot of the draft, but even this is where you really pack on the depth on your depth chart is in the middle to late rounds. It's just not enough of those hits happening for Carolina over the years, yeah. and that's yep. why it's important that we can just say ah, sixth round and fifth round and seventh round, but hey, it's very important that these guys stick develop and become part of the team. Yep. I, and I, that that's nail on the head again. I think that for us, it's, we got to get our second and third and fourth round guys to really knock it out the park. That's where we, we've been, that's what we've really been missing. Um, yep. Is that third, that middle, that day two talent, getting those guys to develop into something solid. That's where we've been struggling. And then we try to backfill it with free agent talent and we run out of money and we're broke. We can't spend it. And so that's kind of how the Carolina Panthers have, uh, been this never-ending cycle of of uh, of mediocrity is we got to get out of we got to develop our guys. Okay, now uh, give me a grade, Rashad. What's your grade for the draft? Which of course includes Coker. Uh, it includes trades. So uh, how did you think Dan Morgan did? Yeah, I'm gonna give it a, a B minus. Um, if you include if you get include the trades, you include every uh, everything else that went around it, getting our second our future second round pick. Uh, back. I love that. I love that. And again, I think time will tell. Only time will tell how good this draft class is. They've got to be developed. I mean, I've said it a thousand times. Development, development, development. You got to get the best out of these guys. And we can't, you can't change direction mid-course. You, you can't change wow. direction. We got to see what Canellis. I, I think Canellis, and I'll say this, and I've been on, on record saying this on, on plenty of my shows so far uh, this, this offseason, is that I think the Panthers are going to be better than a lot of people give them credit for. You know, we, if you look at every uh, power ranking and all the grades, it's been all bad, right? It's been all bad. We're 32nd, 33rd, or excuse me, uh, 31st, 30th, wherever you're looking, it's been pretty bad. But I think the coaching was so bad last year and inept. Like, I think that had a lot to do with, with the reason why we were so bad. It's not a talent issue. It's a coaching issue. So now you get a competent, young, a forward-thinking head coach, uh, a forward-thinking mind, offensive mind, creative mind. I think that it's going to get the the wheels turning sooner rather than later. I'm not saying we'll make the playoffs or anything like that. I sure. wouldn't. I'd be a fool to say that. But I will say I, I I'll go on a limb to say that we'll seven, six to seven, eight wins. I think that's that's plausible for the Carolina Panthers this year. I think that's how bad we were last year from a coaching standpoint. 
and, and again, for again, which is why we would like for you to subscribe for a number of reasons here, but also because uh, we are going to talk more uh, once we get into training camp and so forth. Rashad will be back. We'll go inside this depth chart. We we'll have a, a, an opportunity to talk about how some of the camps went summer camps and all that heading into the preseason and so forth. So we'll have a lot to talk about dissecting the roster between that time. You check out, of course, the Panther nation nation podcast, YouTube channel, of course. So you can check out what Rashad has to say about Carolina and all of his uh, excellent videos on the team. A uh, couple of quick things before we wrap up. Uh, okay. Good draft. Uh, some good players were added to the team. It looks like pass rush though seems to still be an issue. There's still a hole there. Now, they did bring in Clowney, but that always seems to be a temporary fix uh, wherever he goes. So, um, but, you know, I'll, I'll leave it. The floor is yours. What is still needed after this offseason? Because we're pretty much nearing the end of it. Yeah, I would say the biggest need for, for me right now is cornerback. I mean, you mentioned edge rusher. I'll say this. With the edge rushers, Eva Rowe normally gets pretty good production out of his edge rushes. Ne Even you go back to the 2022 Broncos roster, there wasn't, a, I think the highest uh, sack total was six and a half sacks by an individual, right? So that okay. it's, he, they, he doesn't need an elite pass rusher to have a solid defense. What he does need is good cornerbacks, right? That his defense is predicated upon a secondary, stopping the pass, slowing down the pass, and uh, making that quarterback hold on to the football that much longer to then allow your pass rush to get there. So I think it, it, it's a, it all depends on how you look at it, right? And I think okay. the biggest hole for us right now, we got Dane Jackson as a starter, who I think is a rotational guy up in up in Buffalo before he got to Carolina. And you got JC. JC is elite, right, when he's on the field. Is he going to stay on the field the entire year? I hope so. This is a contract year for him. So I hope he does. But right now I'm looking at bringing back a Stephon Gilmore. Xavier Howard's still out there, so there there's a couple guys that I need to. I'm looking at bringing in here to Carolina to shore up that secondary. Safety wise, we're fine. Uh, Jordan Fuller uh, and uh, Xavier Woods, we're, we're we're straight there. I have no no quarrels with that. But the cornerbacks, we need another solid cornerback to make this thing go. And I think that's the biggest hole for us for the Carolina Panthers right now. Okay, and um, I and and it's too bad that we're doing this now before the schedule is released, but. Um, because did you notice anything by the way regarding no, the schedule? Just no, just the Germany no. game. Just no, okay, just, just and who Germany are they playing? Yes. The Giants in Germany, Giants, November 10th. Giants, Germany. Okay, so it's yeah. a, a, a Brian Burns blood and guts game. So Brian Burns and Carolina going at it should be okay. interesting. All right, um, okay, now uh, let's uh. And this because I want to talk about just a little bit on the dynasty angle. And we talked about Brooks. So, again, I think that's interesting to note that in the league that I'm in with Dave, uh, again, Brooks went ninth overall. Uh, so he was the first running back taken. Uh, let's see, Leggett, uh, let's see, where did he go? Uh, looks like, and a lot of receivers obviously went. He went in the second round. He was the eighth pick of the second round. So he went before Franklin. Polk, Burton, Quarterly, Wilson, Baker, so forth and so on. Uh, he went just ahead of Mitchell and Pearsall. So it was Mitchell, Pearsall, Leggett. And uh, by the way, Pearsall do you know uh, who – what's that? I probably would have went Pearsall first. That 49ers oh. offense, depending on what happened with their receivers, he's, he's kind of going to be the future. So I don't know about, yeah, I don't know uh, about Leggett over Pearsall. Yeah, well, that no, that's actually how it went. It went Mitchell, Pearsall, Leggett. Um, okay, okay, go. My bad. Yeah, I thought you meant that. Yeah. Um, he did go ahead, though, of, of some of those others like Franklin, Polk, and Burton. Yeah, but yeah. here's the interesting one is that uh, somebody by the name of Dave Rhodes uh, has three picks so far, and his three picks have been first round, eighth pick overall, Xavier Worthy. Second pick, and again, you don't have his depth chart, so you don't know why he's making the picks, but second yeah. round pick, Xavier Leggett. And he likes the X. And third round pick, tight end, Jatavion Sanders. That Jatavion Sanders pick, might it, it's going to pay off. He's going to be solid, man. I'm telling you, he's going to be very, very good. Uh, he's already compared himself to the next Greg Olsen, or wants to be the next Greg Olsen. So 
we'll see, man. We'll see what happens with them. We'll see. Yep. Um, so yeah. So as far as that's concerned, uh, th- those I-, I thought th- that was interesting to bring that up. Um, and then Coker would be the other guy just to throw in there. Uh, of course, you're not going to draft him in a dynasty league, but yeah. that's a guy that you d- definitely want to keep an eye on uh, for dynasty league owners out there. Uh, and the reasons that we talked about in the beginning of the show, because uh, so you're going to get these, like you said, uh, of course, Rashad, there's always these under the radar college free agents. They make teams all the time, at least one or two. That, that's the way it should be if you're developing right and making the right call uh, on these prospects. And so we'll see if Coker, even though it's a deep room now, we'll see if he can, but it's open. It's a wide open room now. And we'll see, uh, matter of fact, the next time we talk, uh, it's going to be very interesting to find out um, how it all looks as far as the real depth chart at wide receiver. I know it'll only be the summer, but I'm sure uh, all the, because there's a lot of young players here. So they have to make big moves in, even in the summer, even without the pads on at every chance you get as you're a young receiver, you know, whether it's Leggett, Smith, Marset, Mingo, Marshall, Coker, all these guys have got to do their best during the summer to put themselves in position uh, to get uh, a leg up uh, for training camp, which is when next time we're going to talk again, Rashad. So absolutely. I, I appreciate agree. it. And uh, again, want to remind everybody, cause you have one of these. Now, I don't know if you have an actual, I think you have the PDF version. So, um, yeah. but you can get the hard copy, you get the PDF version and uh, also the draft review guide, because this is going to be out. The reason why I'm interviewing uh, Rashad. And of course I, I would have done it anyway, but uh, the timing issue reason is because uh, I am uh, I've got Carolina as one of the teams that I have to write for in the draft review guide. So I'm sure a, a lot of what you heard here today will go into the uh, outline of the draft review that I give for Carolina. And I appreciate that Rashad uh, sincerely and uh, you do a great job. And uh, uh, I think that even though t- times are tough for teams like uh, Carolina and the Jets, uh, we have to just keep positive. And yeah. uh, one of these years, we're going to kind of have that season that like Jeff Risden had, our buddy who covers the Detroit Lions. Uh, yeah. He had the big breakout season last year. So yeah, we man. need one of those. Yeah, shout so. out to him. I, I know we did the joint show last year. and that, Yeah, so that's that's good to see. You know, he stuck stuck with it. And again, the Lions, they, they've been uh, down for so long. So it's it's actually good to see them, them win. It is. Uh, you don't. You, there's a lot of teams you hate to see win, but the Lions, is, that's a great story. And kudos to all those fans. And the Carolina Panthers now find themselves in very similar. Uh, it ain't been that bad, but it's been pretty bad around here. And so hopefully, like you said, it'll, it'll change and our, our first fortunes will change. But we've had our glory days. 2015, we were riding high and NFL is cyclical. It's up and down, up and down. And only the strong survive, right? Only the strong survive. Well, it's, it's time. And uh, it looks like uh, I think, and I know we'll talk, of course, more about this uh, in training camp, but when you got a, a talent like Bryce Young, uh, he's had his rookie year, so that's out of the way. Uh, th- there's more talent on this team. There's better coaching on this team. It's not a very strong division. Um, I think they can compete to win the division this year. Uh, I had Tampa Bay winning the division last year. Everybody laughed at me, and Tampa Bay won the division. So I'm not saying I'm picking Carolina just yet, but I'm I'll just say, saying. Say, that, who are you gonna pick? Go ahead and pick it so it happens, please. It, it's too <laughs> early. We need all the yes. we need all the booty we can get, man. Yeah, uh, but that's it's under consideration because that ha- that's how important the league NFL. What's the most two important positions? Coach, quarterback. That's that's the two most important positions. And Carolina, you hope that they've got the right uh, uh, combo right there, and I think it's very possible they do. So, uh, when is your next show? Uh, on YouTube, Rashad, and when when is it um, regular schedule? Yes, yeah, we go live every Tuesday uh, at eight PM. But we okay. always it's very important to hit that notification bell when you subscribe to us because we go live all the time. Uh, we're gonna have a schedule release reaction tonight, late tonight at nine thirty. Uh, once the schedule is fully out, we'll digest it and talk about the the ebbs and flows of the schedule. Um, and so, yeah, anytime we'll be live for training camps and all that other stuff. But Tuesday is our regularly scheduled show. All right. Matter of fact, I was just noticing, uh, let's see, is this a comment? Uh, C3 Panther Pickle. Shout yeah, out he's to Panthers there, YouTuber man. podcasters. So there it is. There's C3 Panther Pickle. So anyway, we got one in because it's a live broadcast. So, uh, Rashad, appreciate it. 
Can't wait to talk more Carolina Panthers football once we get to training camp. Thank you. Absolutely. Appreciate it, buddy. Thank you.